We've got too many tests to go over today that we don't have any time to waste on a compelling cold open. So let's just say Panasonic S1. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and this is the viewer selected greeting. It also includes this sentence. So let's start with the photo side of things, because despite this camera having pretty great video performance, I still feel like it's a photo first camera, essentially a full frame G9. But before we get too far into that, I should take a minute to thank Camera Canada for supplying me with this S1 kit so I could make this video. Camera Canada carries a wide range of Panasonic bodies and lenses, so if you're in the market, make sure you check out their links in the description below. When it comes to photography, the Panasonic S1 gets almost everything right. In fact, it's probably easier to list the things that the camera can't do, since there's really only one, and that's shoot very high frame rate action with consistent focus. But I was still pleasantly surprised with how well it did perform in that regard, but we'll get into that a little bit later on. Everything else is here though, the body is well built and easy to use, although size wise it's more like a prosumer DSLR, so not really a compact travel camera, so you have to keep that in mind, but the buttons are all there and laid out nicely. The EVF is fantastic, high res, 120 frames per second, adjustable diopter, nice eye cup. It's probably the best EVF on the market right now, and it's one of the only ones I've used that maintains its excellent EVF performance when also in the 4K video modes. The panel is also fantastic. It has that Fuji style three-way tilt, so it's great for low angle portraits as well, and it's very bright and handles direct sunlight better than a lot of the competition. The battery life is very good, and if used reasonably, you can get much higher than the 360 shot SEPA rating. If you don't chimp and just shoot, you can easily get several hundred photos and upwards of a thousand on a single charge. The battery is also chargeable via USB, and you can also charge it while using it, which is great for time lapses and video. And we'll get more into video a little bit later on, but battery life for video is really good. You can get about two and a half hours of 4K video recording, so pretty good battery performance all the way around. It's got all the functions you come to expect from Panasonic, like the 6K photo modes. It's got the high resolution modes, so you can drastically increase your image resolution by assembling multiple frames in camera, as well as HLG photo, focus peaking, post focus, and multiple exposures with overlays. And speaking of overlays, there's also this new function called Shear Overlay, which allows you to choose an image you've already taken and overlay it on top of your view at a transparency level you set, and it stays like that until you stop it or until you turn the camera off. This is extremely useful for matching compositions. Pretty much any tool or mode you could think to use is likely in this camera, plus a few awesome new things that you might not have thought of. Like when using a zoom lens, the camera displays your focal length on the screen, so you don't have to guess based on the markings on the lens. Now I've seen this in some other cameras before, but it's pretty rare, and I'm happy that they included it on the S1. It also has a night mode, which makes the display much darker and only uses red light, so that you can preserve your night vision and also reduce camera added light pollution. Oh, and remember how much I like the Canon EOS R's Focus Guide minigame? Well the Panasonic S1 might have the best in-camera minigame yet with the inclusion of their IS status scope, which basically shows you how steady you're holding the camera. You get this target and you got to try and keep the green dot in the middle. It's incredibly frustrating and I love every minute of it. But that's a decent segue into the stabilization, which is excellent on this camera. Now I'm using the kit lens, so I'm getting dual IS because the lens is stabilized as well, but I was able to get over five stops of shutter speed reduction using this combo. And that definitely helps because this lens is long and heavy, and it also has surprisingly good macro capabilities. Now, it's not a true one-to-one, -one, but it can go one-to-two, which is better than what you get with most zooms. Overall, the kit lens is pretty good. It's a 24 to 105 f4, and it's a pricey one at that. Now, I don't generally get too excited about this kind of lens, but while we wait for more glass to come out, it'll definitely get the job done, and it's pretty versatile despite its f4 limitation. Because like I said, you can compensate for that quite easily. The shutter speed can go surprisingly low because of how good the IBIS is, and the high ISO performance is fantastic. Now, this might be a bit more pertinent to the video shooters, but if we compare the S1 to the Sony a7 III and the Panasonic GH5, we can see that the low light performance on this camera is outstanding. It holds up noticeably better than even the a7 III at ISO 6400 and beyond. Now I can't really fairly test the sensor for image quality because there's not enough lenses out right now to do a true apples to apples comparison, so I'll probably come back to this down the road once Sigma gets their L mount lenses out and then we can do an actual one to one comparison, and also by that time there might be the video upgrade firmware available as well. But in the meantime though, I can say that this sensor tested quite well at DxO mark, coming in very close score wise to the Sony a7 III and sharing almost the same dynamic range at 14.5 stops. But on a more subjective note, I can definitely say that I've been quite pleased with the quality of the images I've been getting out of this camera. The body is also very well weather sealed and is quite well balanced even when using larger lenses. So like I said, this should satisfy most photographers who don't mind larger cameras, unless they require very high frame rate continuous AF. If you need high speed single AF, it's got you covered. You can get it to nine frames per second that way. 
but when you mix in tracking, the performance does go down. Now it's rated for six frames per second with continuous AF, but what I like to do to test the practical usefulness of the drive speed is to set the emphasis to focus priority. This way, it won't take the picture unless it's in focus. Then I'll see how many frames it's actually able to capture over a given period of time while tracking movement. And when I did that, the Panasonic S1 was only able to get about four frames per second continuous in focus, which is actually pretty good for a contrast-based AF system and better than I expected. So if that's all you'll ever need, then I think you'll be happy. By the way, you'll probably want to set it to focus priority anyway, because I found the keeper rate to be much, much higher versus when I was using balanced emphasis. And it's not like it slowed the camera down that much anyway, like it does with some of the competition. And I definitely rather have four frames in focus than five or six frames out of focus. But this is one area where the Sony a7 III pulled significantly ahead. I put it through the same difficult test, which involved me walking through different intensities of light with different colors and temperatures with the drive speed set to the highest setting and forcing focus priority. And the Sony managed to grab 56 shots with all of them being usable, where the Panasonic S1 only got about 29 during that same seven second window. So that's eight usable shots per second on the Sony versus about four on the Panasonic. Often people tell me that my autofocus test isn't really fair because of the type of light and the changing light, etc. But that's kind of the point. People who want high frame rate action might also shoot sports and they might shoot sports indoors. And if you've ever shot sports indoors, you'll know that the light can change drastically from one end to the other with different intensities and flickering and temperatures and all kinds of problems like that. And so if you're looking for a camera that can shoot sports, I would definitely say that the Sony wins in this department. But I was pleasantly surprised with how well the S1 held up compared to that. Again, it's slower, but I think if you don't require the most intense action, I think you can actually still get the job done with it. And it's contrast-based AF, and I wasn't expecting that. And for the sake of being thorough, I also tested the S1 using the face and eye detection, the subject tracking mode, as well as the spot AF and the 225 wide mode. And they all perform pretty much the same, except for the subject tracking, which didn't really handle me approaching the camera too well at all. I also tested a few of the different custom AF sets that are programmed in there for tracking different types of movements. And again, there wasn't that much difference between them. The best I could do indoors with mixed lighting was about 4.4 frames usable per second. I then repeated these tests outdoors when the sun was nice and bright to see how well it would fare for wildlife shooters and outdoor action photographers. And the results were a little bit better. Oh, by the way, there's also a built-in animal detection function in the AF modes. So if any of the viewers have the S1 and have tested the animal AF, let us know in the comments how well you think it performs. Now for the outdoor test, my best keeper rate was 5.33 frames per second in focus, which is actually quite admirable and impressive for a contrast-based AF system. And what I like best about the system is actually the consistency. It may not be the fastest out there, but it performed the same in both front lit and back lit scenarios. The buffer on the S1 is plenty large, and for the sake of AFC, essentially infinite, since the camera is able to clear it faster than it can take pictures in most cases. But when I let it just fire away on maximum speed, it was able to get about 140 shots on a UHS-2 SD card before it started to slow down, and on a UHS-1 SD card, it was about 80 shots. And it has two card slots, by the way, one for a UHS-2 SD card and the other for an XQD card. Now, AF Single works really well, unless you're trying to focus on bright lights in a really dark environment, which is to be expected from Panasonic's DFD. But I'm also happy to report that all of our previous lighting accessories still work on the Panasonic S1. So anything that we had for the Panasonic G9 and GH5, etc., it seems like the hot shoe is pretty much the same. So our Olympus-type Godox equipment, TT350s and transmitters and that, they all work as well. And although I haven't tested it, I believe that this is also true for the microphone XLR adapter from the GH5. And manual focus is excellent too. There's plenty of tools and guides and focus peaking to make sure that you nail manual focus every time. And they've also added the ability to change the linear focusing from the typical non-linear focusing that you find in mirrorless cameras. And they've also added the ability to choose how long you want the focus throw to be or how much the focus moves when you turn the ring. This will be great for choosing the perfect focusing speed for the application and keep it consistent. And this is a much appreciated addition. By the way, all of these tests were done shooting raw. So you might be able to squeak out a little bit more performance if you're shooting JPEG. Now there's no compressed RAW in this camera, but the RAW file format is the same from the previous Panasonics and it's already accepted by all the common RAW developers. I also found the image and color to be quite similar to the previous Panasonic cameras like the GH5 and the G9. So your workflow when it comes to photo and video editing for color should be mostly the same. And that's a bit of a common thread here, which I quite enjoy. You don't really have to relearn much. If you've used Panasonic in the past, you can just grab this camera and start shooting. Everything will feel really natural and your workflow and accessories will carry over as well. 
There are a few differences with video, however, if you're coming from the GH5. While the photo functions have been maintained and added to, the video functions have been reduced a little bit. You still get unlimited recording, which is great, except for the 4K60 mode, that's capped out at a 30 minute time limit. And that 4K60 mode also has a 1.5 times crop, by the way, where all the other 4K modes use a 6K oversampled readout and don't have a time limit. Still probably better than anything else out there in the hybrid space but noteworthy limitations. Also, you can't quite customize your video stream in the same way you could on the GH5. You can't really choose your combination of bit rate and bit depth to the same extent. All of the bit rates are fixed and all of the bit depths are 8-bit 420. That is, of course, unless you enter into the HLG mode, which switches over to the H265 codec and you do get 10-bit 420 and a smaller bit rate to feed into the HEVC that it uses. Now, I believe you will get 422 over HDMI, even though it doesn't actually say that anywhere in the camera or in the manual, but I believe it's gonna perform like the Sony where basically everything else stays the same, but you do get a little bit of extra chroma resolution when you record externally. It's not gonna change an 8-bit option into 10-bit magically just by using HDMI, but I believe we actually will get some more capability with that in the future with firmware. You still get zebras and focus peaking, but you no longer have some of those creative functions like the 4K cropping and the programmable focus transitions. Also, there seems to be a weird quirk where the camera goes into this full auto mode when using the variable frame rate slow motion modes. You can't seem to adjust any of your exposure settings while in that high speed video mode. The HDMI options are a bit reduced as well. You basically only have the choice between clean and info display. Now the info display works well and screen blackout and dual monitoring is all handled correctly. But using the HDMI connection does have some obscure impacts on performance. Most notably, your drive speed in continuous still shooting goes down to only two frames per second. Now this will probably only affect reviewers who try to capture what their camera's doing when they're shooting continuously because who else really does that? But it's important to note because if you happen to read or watch a review on the S1 that says it can only do two frames per Per second, that reviewer probably had their HDMI connected. The HDMI port is full size though, which is great, and you also get a proper mic and headphone jack and a USB-C port used for charging and data. And the camera also smartly disables sleep mode when it detects an HDMI connection, so you can use the camera for streaming for long periods without issue while concurrently charging it over USB. The body also handles heat quite well. Despite there being a 30 minute limit on 4K60, I decided to run back to back recordings at 30 minutes long on 4K60 until the battery ran out and I never had any overheating problems at all. So unless you live in extremely hot environments, I don't think that heat will be an issue for you on this camera. I also did some quick grades for CineD and HLG on the S1 and GH5 and found them to be very, very easy to match and in some ways were identical. So no issues there if you're mixing footage or want to adapt LUTs or presets you've made. But overall, I'd say the Panasonic S1 was able to squeeze out a slightly more detailed image over the GH5 despite having a slower lens on, so that's quite impressive. But it still suffers from the same shortcomings as the GH5 when it comes to continuous autofocus for video. You can configure it to work as quickly or as smoothly as you'd like, and it'll find focus and be nice and sharp, but the reliability just isn't there. It's very easy to move in a certain way or have something in the frame that will just cause the camera to hunt, and during that 90 minute test stream that I did, I tried pretty much every different autofocus mode, and each one of them still had a problem where after a few minutes the camera would just sort of go out of focus and then come back in and then it'd be fine again for a few minutes but you just don't have any long-term reliability with it. Like I was saying earlier the IBIS is quite good. It has both the normal shake reduction mode as well as a boost mode that's useful if you're trying to maintain a static shot handheld. It basically makes you into a tripod and it's impressive every time. And here's another place where the camera's weight plays a positive role. It's definitely heavy enough to give you enough muscle resistance to reduce a lot of the minor shakes. And then when you combine that with the dual IS, you get that impressively smooth footage we're used to seeing from Panasonic. Lastly, a quick note on sound, when compared to the GH5 or most of the other cameras to come out recently, I would say that the Panasonic S1 has one of the best built-in mics I've heard. This is an audio test of the Panasonic GH5. I have the level set to minus six dB because at zero it was clipping using the built-in mic. There's no mic level limiter turned on or wind cut filter or anything like that. This is an audio test of the Panasonic S1. I'm using the built-in mic into the camera and the audio level is set to minus 6 dB in order to prevent clipping, but the limiter is turned off and so is the wind filter. However, also when compared to the GH5, the S1 is noticeably noisier. When normalized to the same volume, the S1's noise level sits about 6 dB higher than the GH5's, but the output levels are also lower when you set the camera to the same level, like say minus 6 dB on both cameras, the GH5 is louder. So you're definitely gonna get a better signal to noise ratio out of the GH5, and this extends into the external mic input as well.
But there also might be a bit of a hidden advantage here. If you've been using a mic that's too hot on the GH5, even when you have the GH5 set all the way down to minus 12 dB, it might not be too hot on the S1. And I also like how you can now customize the mic jack on the S1 to either supply power to the mic, not supply power, or change to a line level input. Another thing that I really love is the ability to separate the settings between the photo and video manual modes. In a lot of the other cameras that I've used, whenever you set anything in one manual mode, it overlaps in the other. So for example, say that you were in the movie manual mode and you set your shutter speed that you wanted to use for that video. But then you switched over to the photo manual mode and you changed the shutter speed, it would also be changed in that movie manual, normally requiring you to set a custom state in order to have your video settings separately. Well, you don't have to do that on the Panasonic S1. You can actually choose which settings you want to remain unchanged when switching back and forth, between the two manual modes, and this makes switching between photo and video much more efficient, and I highly approve of this addition. All right, I think that's it, so now let's talk about value and the ideal customer. It's pretty early days for the system. We don't have a large enough lens selection yet, and I also don't know what kind of potential value future firmware updates are gonna add. But it's definitely an interesting proposition, and there is a lot of video potential here. Imagine a GH5 with significantly improved low light performance and better image quality. Well, I guess that would be the GH5S, but the GH5S up until recently was the same price as the Panasonic S1 at $2,500 US dollars. It now sits $300 lower than the S1 at $2,200 US. But what if that GH5S had terrific image stabilization, vastly improved photo capabilities, and probably still better low light performance without giving up anything other than its slightly smaller size? Would you pay $300 for that? I suppose you'd also be giving up the flip-out screen, but let's be real, this probably isn't a flip-out vlog-style camera, and when it comes to photos, I vastly prefer that three-way tilting mechanism anyway. And as a photo camera, I truly believe that once we start getting those Sigma lenses for L-mount, we're gonna have one of the best image producers in the game, as long as your game isn't super high-speed action. But for a portrait or wedding photographer, landscapes, product, architecture and real estate, macro, you name it, basically every other discipline, this camera is up there with the best of them. But we also can't ignore the fact that the competition is $500 cheaper and does most of the stuff that the Panasonic does. And in the case of the Sony, it absolutely destroys it in the continuous autofocus department and makes Sony the obvious choice over the Panasonic for someone shooting action. So if that's what you like to do, definitely save the $500. Sony lenses are already available and you'll have very good video performance as well. I think that what will be the draw here is people who like the Panasonic style. There's definitely value in having every feature and function you could think of packed into a robust, professional feeling camera, laid out using a brilliant menu system with a very intuitive touchscreen experience with virtually no interface-based shortcomings. And I think for plenty of shooters, that's worth the $500. It's basically a full-frame G9 and then some, and is really only one Sony autofocus system away from being the perfect camera for a lot of people. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right. I'm done.